I did figure since it was the most important video of the year that Benny should join us for a little bit. Benny, look at the camera. Just look at the camera. Oh, isn't he the most gorgeous cat? I know I'm biased. And, I, I, and yes, I did have to manipulate him to come in here with treats. Hello, Bibliophiles. My name is Jill, and it's time for my favorite video of the year. It's my best books of 2021. This year, I decided to actually narrow it down to 10, which I don't think I've done before. My cat is still going for the treat bag. He is not a dummy. I don't remember what I was saying because I've been so distracted by the cat. This is why he's not in my videos because he distracts me. I love him so much. Let's get down to it. I've picked 10 books that are my favorite this year. I've even ranked them, which I have, I don't think I've ever done before. Um, and I actually don't feel super confident about this list, uh, although the ranking of this list, just because I do feel like I've read a lot of books I really, really liked this year and some I even loved, but I don't know if they're books that will be like forever favorites in the way that other years I've had that experience. Um, so what I've decided to do and how I kind of chose my best books of the year is basically on my reading experience of them. The books that are on this list are books that when I was reading them I just felt completely immersed in the story, completely in that world. Um, books that I just wanted to pick up over and over again, books that um, the reading experience was just an absolute pleasure and pure escapism from my life. I do have some honorable mentions and I think that this will surprise some people because <laughs> I, the list, my top 10 surprises me as well. Um, but I think the fact that Patrick Brown and Keefe, my favorite author and his book Empire of Pain uh, came out this year and it is it won the Baylor G Bailey Gifford Prize. It's on like basically every best of books list this year. But it's not in my top 10. <laughs> and, um, it's honorable mention, of course, because it is a really, really excellent book. I have a full review of it. I'll link it down below if you want to watch it. Um, but that book is about the Sackler family, the people who created, uh, Purdue, people who owned Purdue Pharma and created Oxycontin and were um, instrumental in prolonging, creating and prolonging um, the opioid crisis. And that book is excellently written. It's super interesting. Um, but I, it's not a favorite, I wouldn't say, because it is, I think, it's very of the moment in the sense that, like, when this book was published, there's still an ongoing court case. And I think it's, I don't know if it's been resolved, but there's been, you know, developments over the years since the book has been published. And something about the kind of immediacy of that um, just didn't, it just didn't push over the edge for me as in terms of a favorite book. Everything Patrick Brandon Keefe writes is worth reading. Without further ado, let's talk about my top 10 books of 2021. Number 10, The Patriots by Sana Krasikov. This was a book that I got from Olive when we did, uh, a book Olive when we did our exchange where we sent each other books. I was very skeptical of this book. It's quite long and I just wasn't sure if it was going to be the right fit for me. And let me tell you, this is a book that I loved reading, but also I have thought about, I read it in February, I think, and I have thought about it all year. And so I just couldn't not put it on this list. So this is the story of um, Florence, who is an American, and it's set in the 1920s and 30s. And she meets an, a Russian man uh, on like a work exchange thing, and she just falls in love with him, and she decides to go to Russia. And so she goes to Russia, takes this big adventure by herself. She actively goes to the Soviet Union, leaves, uh, you know, capitalist America goes right to the Soviet Union and she loves it. She falls in love with the Soviet world. And I think this, and so this also follows her son, um, you know, in, in 60 years later or whatever it is. So we do have like multiple family generations. Again, something I love, you know, spanning a long period of time, something I love, set in the Soviet Union, something I love. So all, all these elements are very much me. Olive knows my taste very well. But what I loved about this book was that I, I loved the trajectory of following Florence's feelings about America, about the Soviet Union, about what the meaning of home is. And there's all these people who kind of come and go and we kind of see her love of the system changing over time. I just really enjoyed that development. There is a part of this book that takes place in the present day, which I found a bit less interesting, but I loved Florence's story so much and parts of Julian's story, Julian is her son, I just loved it so much that I couldn't not put this on my list of best books of the year. It's a book I will definitely revisit and a book I think about often. So thank you all for sending it to me and this is number 10 of my favorite books of the year. Number nine is Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zauner and this is a memoir that I read in one day. 
First of all, let's just talk about this, the spectacularness that is this cover. There's an H, there's noodles. This is very much focused on food in this book. And then it looks like tears. I mean, everything in this cover is perfection. Um, this is the story of Michelle who loses her mother uh, to cancer. And Michelle is part Korean, part, I don't know if he's, her father's German or American. Perhaps he's both. Um, but she's part Korean. This book is very much focused on her relationship with her mother, um, both as, you know, the mother-daughter relationship, as well as her relationship to her mother as her part of her Korean identity. And so I love, I read this book in one day. I found it super compelling, very well written, very easy to read, kind of funny, really sad. Um, but what I liked about it the most, I think, is how she uses food as a way to kind of unpack her feelings about her relationship to her culture, to her family, um, how she understands her mother through food. I felt like that connection was really strong and really well developed in here. And I do really think that food is, um, you know, it is incredibly important culturally, um, but she uses it a lot as like, it's like her language to be able to express herself. And the, the way that she traces that thread through the whole book is genius, really, really well done really compelling. It has stuck with me since I've read it and I really really loved this book. Book number eight is another memoir by another Korean woman. This is Inferno, a memoir of motherhood and madness by Catherine Cho. I picked this book on my list because it is one of the most compelling um, unputdownable books I've ever read. This is the author's experience of having a psychotic break um, shortly after her son was born. I think he's about three months old. This book is so effective I think because of the way it is written, the way, not just the language and the writing style, which is very, very good, but the structure of this book. So she has, a, this whole book is centered around the fact that she has had a psychotic break, but she doesn't tell you the details of that until the very, very end of the book. It's like the last 20 pages of the book. Instead, what we get at the beginning is her recollections of her early life and her, you know, up until being, having a child um, and so, kind of the challenges of being Korean, being Korean American with her family, as well as some things that have happened to her in her past. Um, and as well as her her family, but also her husband's family, those challenges she has with them. Um, and also some good things, you know, it's it's very well-rounded. Um, but also we, we get her insights about being in a psych psychiatric hospital and her trying to piece together what has happened and her feelings around um, trying to remember uh, what happened and how she feels about her son and about her family and about herself and so we have those kind of two things kind of interjecting at the beginning of this book to shape the narrative that leads us up to her psychotic break. I think it goes a long way to destigmatize the idea that like oh people have psychotic breaks or people who are like um, I don't know just like so people have lots of mental health challenges or very ill or like who are on drugs or whatever like you know the kind of the stigma that we have around something like the word psychotic break she gives you this this really well-rounded well picture to show you like the complexities around mental illness. And I thought this was really effective, really, um, really challenging to read in some ways. Like the very end is very difficult to read, but also just, I couldn't put it down. Very compelling, well-written. And I'd like to read more from Catherine Cho. I don't know if anything else will come out from her, but I just found this absolutely unputdownable. Book number seven is one I genuinely never thought I would see on any list for me ever <laughs> and I am as shocked as you are this is the story of a new name by Elena Ferrante this is translated from the Italian by Anne Goldstein this is the second book in the Neapolitan novels I always want to say Napoleon but that's not right <laughs> one of my reading goals this year was to read the first book my brilliant friend in this uh I was gonna say quadrology, <laughs> quartet. I liked My Brilliant Friend. I buddy read it with Jennifer Tibbetts, um, but I don't know if I would have picked this up right away, but she had said like, let's read the second one this year. And so because we had planned it, uh, I decided, we, I read it. And I can't believe that I almost didn't pick this up this year <laughs> because this book, listen, it is, I don't even have the words for it because it is, there's, there's a part of the middle of part of this book um, I don't I, I don't want to say too much, I guess, because it's the second book in a, in a quartet, so you don't want to, like, um, give a lot away. But also, everyone's already read this. I'm, like, the last person on the planet to read this book. But the way that this author captures um, the feelings of, like, betrayal of youth is just, like, it hit me right in the gut. I was like, I feel this. I feel this in my soul. Um, the sense of, like, 
you feel betrayed but you haven't been betrayed by anyone but you've betrayed yourself and that kind of that whimsy of youth like fully captured in here i actually think i hate everyone in this book um but that it doesn't make them any less compelling i wanted to know everything that was going to happen to everyone and this book is something that like i felt completely immersed in this world i when I was reading this book I was like I was in Italy I was in this small little town and like I was eating those prosciutto sandwiches and I was like strolling along the piazza and like I just had this totally took me away into a different reality it gave me that complete immersive experience that I was really craving this year and it also like emotionally destroyed me to the point where I had to put it down for a while because I was so emotionally distraught by this book I can't not acknowledge that level of like tugging on my heartstrings like I can't I, and I put this down and I like almost immediately picked up the third book and I decided to wait because I wasn't sure I was emotionally ready for it but I like was so compelled to know what was going to happen next I really just needed to keep reading and to me that's again like a marker of like a really excellent um pro propulsive narrative so yeah this is my number what number is this number seven of my favorite books of this year. Book number six is Unsettled Ground by Claire Fuller. This is a book I've talked about kind of throughout the year and I guess I kind of realized when I was putting this list together that like oh it's a favorite. <laughs> it's a book that I really really enjoyed reading. This is the story of Jeannie and Julius. They're twins and they're in their I think they're 50 or 51 and their mother dies of a stroke and in the very first like pages of this book and so then they are people who have lived alone. They've lived with their mother uh, for their entire lives and now that she's gone they're kind of left to their own devices and there are people who um, they're extremely poor they've kind of lived off this land there's a story about how they got this land and they're trying to figure out how to survive without their mother who protected them for so long from so much information protected is an interesting word that we kind of explore in here where it's like did she protect them or did she really screw them over <laughs> because they are really left to figure stuff out and they don't have all the information they need to figure it out. This is really the story of a coming of age at 50. I really liked the way that their life is explained in here. They are extremely poor, but they don't know, I guess they know they're poor, but they don't really realize the complexity of their poverty until their mother is gone and how they kind of navigate that. And then also as adults who now don't have their mother, how their lives kind of deviate in ways it didn't before. I think this is a really beautifully written novel and the more I talk about it, the more I really can't wait to reread it. Also, this is probably one of my favorite covers of the year. Yeah, one of my favorites this year. Getting into the top five, this is book number five and this is a book, again, I did not foresee making it onto the top 10, let alone the top five, but I haven't stopped thinking about the reading experience of reading this book and it is Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. First of all, can we talk about these unremovable stickers. Listen, may 2022 be the year of removable stickers on books. Anyway, this book was shortlisted for the booker this year. I probably wouldn't have picked it up except something about it was like really compelling to me and like just, just like the title or like I don't even know what it was. Maybe it was just like the enormity of this book. It's like 600 and something pages and um so I had to buddy read it with um my friend Aaron and Rachel and I just loved reading this book. I loved it. It's again a sweeping narrative of these these two siblings. I can't remember her names. Marion and is it Peter? Jamie. Marion and Jamie um it kind of follows their parents and then follows their lives well into adulthood and again I love a sweeping narrative that follows many years. I love sibling stories and I just loved it. I just loved reading this book. I always wanted to pick it up. I was never bored. I truly couldn't wait to find out what's happening with every character. There's some parts in here that are not perfect. Like this is a book that feels like, as often long books do, there's parts you could probably take out. Um, but none of it, I just liked reading all of it. None of it felt wasteful. None of it felt unnecessary. I just enjoyed every moment I spent with this book. And I don't think it's a particularly profound story. I don't think it's a book that um, will become a classic or anything, but like, Man, I loved reading it and I have found myself thinking about how it felt to read this book, like sitting in my chair, my reading chair with like a cup of coffee and like just totally immersing myself in this total world um, for, you know, hours at a time. Just a really wonderful reading experience. So this 
has to be on my list and just makes it right in the middle at number five. Book number four is The Man Who Saw Everything by Deborah Levy. This is a book I did not expect to enjoy, truly. I did not expect to enjoy it at all. And from basically page two, I was like, I love this book. <laughs> Her writing is amazing. The character, the, the narrative of this book is completely unreliable. It's set um, at just before the fall of the Berlin Wall in England and Germany. Two settings I absolutely love. And then we follow this story of, what's the narrator's name again? Saul. And the big twist in this book happens right in the middle, like smack dab in the middle of this book. And then as you read the second part of the book, I, I don't even want to tell you it's about really because it's so short. It's like less than 200 pages. You need to kind of just read it. Um, but the big twist in the middle and then reading the last half of the book makes you question everything you read in the first part of the book. And I felt like this was such a smartly crafted book because there was parts like almost everything felt answered, not answered, but like there was a, what's it, like an equal balance, like a equal, what's it like, I'm trying to think of like Einstein, an equal and opposite reaction, whatever, you know what I mean? Basically it's like there was a push and pull on every side. That's, there we go. It's like, it's like a teeter-totter and it was fully balanced on both sides. Well, look at me trying to discover a metaphor. Anyway, this book just delighted me. It um, surprised me. I loved the writing. I thought the characters were, the, the narrator is so unreliable, but he's also dislikable. Like nothing about him isn't is good. Like you just don't want to know this man. Like, every word matters, and so you know I was going through with highlighters and like note making notes, like something I don't often do, but I felt so drawn into the story and trying to like piece together the truth of what happened. Um, just such a delightful experience. Definitely one of my favorites of the year, and could not recommend it more highly. We're on to the top three, and I gotta tell you. I'm not confident <laughs> about these top three. I mean, I do love all three of these books. I'm not confident about the order, I guess is what I mean. I mean, I guess they could all be number one, is what I'm trying to say. But number three is a book I talk about a lot, Piranesi by Susanna Clark, or Piranesi, Piranesi. This is a book that, again, as I've said when I've read it, I've talked about it before, is that I don't think you need to know about what it is before reading it. I think you just have to read it. And I think you will go in and be confused for the first 20 pages and be like, what the F am I reading? And then, you will be completely swept away, completely absorbed in this person's life, completely confused, but also in a really compelling way. I loved this story every single moment that more was revealed. It felt like reading a perfectly paced mystery novel where like everything that is revealed, everything's revealed at the right moment. So nothing ever feels like you're waiting too long, you're too confused for too long. And it also doesn't answer everything. So you kind of, you have a lot of information and you are left to kind of come to your own um, conclusions in a way um, at the end. And I also loved that. I loved that my, I read this for a book club with two of my friends, Stacey and Thea, and we both, we all loved it, but we all read it differently. And I think that is the power of this book. This won the Women's Prize this year and well-deserved. I love this book and I can't wait to reread it. It is, I think, a masterpiece and the more I'm talking about it, maybe it's my number one book of the year, but I don't know. This is a book that um, I often say that a book that you want to read again for the first time, like I wish I could have that experience again of like the awakening of moving through this book, the pleasure of that. I would love to have that experience again. And that to me is a marker of like a really solid, strong book. So yeah, this is definitely on my, in my top three. I haven't put it at number three, <laughs> but you know, one of the best books of the year. Number two is Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller. This is a story of lost love and the hidden order of life. I haven't talked about this book really anywhere because when I read it, I felt, it felt so close to the bone that I just didn't have the language to really talk about why this book affected me so strongly. It really did. Uh, I, read it, I read it at the perfect time. There are two narratives converging in this book. So this is um, a, sort of a memoir and also the history of, what's his name? David Starr Jordan. He was a taxonomist and he dedicated his life to cataloging fish, basically. And it's the story of his successes and failures um, over his lifetime uh, and, you know, how he became really well regarded in the scientific community um, and also why again his successes and failures I don't want to like say too much because there is kind of this not it's not a twist at the end but it's like an interesting reveal at the end um so that's it's a story of his life and she Lulu Miller is like fascinated with his life 
um, and looking at him as the successful person in conjunction, in parallel to her own life, which she, for from a lot of her life, feels like a massive failure. And she kind of explains that through like her childhood and through her teenage years and then through adulthood, through like a very serious breakup that left her devastated for many, many years. Um, and this really struck me. I read it at the time when I was feeling, um, I've talked about this before, but I had a really bad mental health year. And I was feeling really kind of at, at one of my lowest points when I was reading this. And there's a part in here where she talks about being in high school and um, she's also just a beautiful writer, like just poetry, po like beautiful language in here. And she talks about the the weight of suffering as a child, as a teenager, and the weight of like being alive and like not knowing what to do about that. You know those moments where you feel like torn open by a book where you're just like someone has has st stared into your soul and written on a page and that's kind of how I felt reading this book. She talks about when she meets this so she has this bit bad breakup but she talks about meeting this person before they had the breakup and um this is what she says about when she meets him and they they um, become a couple. I felt like I had found a thing I thought could never exist. Refuge. It smelled like cinnamon and its walls were made of bad puns and cheap rhymes piling higher and higher against the chill of the world. This book is absolutely beautiful. It is heartbreaking. It is challenging and it is hopeful and it just came to me at the right time. And book number one is A Ghost in the Throat by Dorian Negrifa. This book had a similar effect to me um, as Why Fish Don't Exist, except this one, um, less personal and more of just like the language is just so striking, gorgeous, just like, I almost feel like she's like a, a wizard with words. Like I felt like the way that her sentences, the journey they took me on and the way that she crafts them is just like, it felt like a treat to discover the end of her paragraphs. Like everything felt, like a little delight, like a little like, oh, I didn't know you were gonna do that with that sentence or with, with that with that paragraph. And I just love the experience of reading this. So this is the story of um, kind of a memoir, but also kind of exploration of um, a woman in history who wrote this particular poem. The poem is about this woman who, uh, written in uh, Gaelic, and it's about this woman who loses her husband uh, in a battle or in a kind of a, he's, he's murdered basically, and she discovers him. And she writes about like the, searing pain of that loss and so the author of this book kind of becomes obsessed with that poem and she to the point where it takes over her life and she talks about like how it's a feminist text in particular ways and it feels almost like um this feels like a beautifully written PhD thesis <laughs> I guess she really does a lot of work to talk about the erasure of women and how this poem is a great example of that throughout history and uh I thought that was just a stunning framing of like her analysis of this poem affecting her own life. I absolutely love reading this book and I will revisit it in the future because I think that there's so much it's such a rich text that I, I probably missed things but I will absolutely love revisiting this over and over and over again. What a year folks! <laughs> what a year! I'm really looking forward to reading in 2022. I have my first couple books picked out already for the year but I'm also glad to have um, had some excellent books cross my path in this year. I would love to know if you've read any of these or what your favorite books of the year were. Let me know in the comments down below. Happy New Year and I will see you guys soon. Bye!